Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Alexandra Cunningham Cameron. I'm the Curator of Contemporary Design and Hint Secretarial Scholar at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Uh, I'm going to do my best to lead us all today through a conversation about Virgil's contribution to architecture and placemaking, and, and I think more broadly a, a, a discussion of how an architectural education or architectural thinking can function to connect people to knowledge um, in a way that Virgil, I think, successfully did with humility and openness and intense creativity. Um, so, I guess famously, Virgil understood that he could pursue an architectural career while studying civil engineering, and he went on to get his master's of architecture at IIT. Um, and he developed a practice that sought to develop something that he mentioned, some of you saw, some of you have seen, a lecture he gave to students at Harvard GSD, um, the idea that design is meant to be cherished. And, and that might sound like a, a very sort of simple spiritual gesture, but it's something that people who work in the design world, who work in architecture, um, find to be incredibly powerful and something that, um, you know, it, it, it is really sort of the seed of how design can have a much broader impact. Um, I'm joined today with a sort of mega panel here of artists, designers, curators, architects, creative consultants, impresarios, and I think the, the multidisciplinarity of this lineup is really uh, a testament to the type of conversation about architecture that we're gonna have. Um, so to my left, uh, Dozi Kanu, Hans Ulrich Obrist, Mafuz Sultan, Samuel Ross. Uh, all of us have uh, personal and professional, in some cases, relationships um, with, with Virgil. Um, in some way, he's, all been, he's been involved in uh, stoking some sort of fire in our lives. Um, for me, I connected with Virgil when I was curating an exhibition on the American fashion designer, Willie Smith, um, who died in 1987 of HIV AIDS. Um, Willie set up a practice that was about uh, creating access to ideas and uh, to creativity through affordable garments. Um, he saw his work as being democratizing. He saw his work as finding a way around capital I institutions and creating people, connecting people with uh, art and creativity. Um, and so I thought, you know, maybe we can sort of follow the tradition that's been set by some of the other conversations today and have all of you sort of share uh, your story with Virgil and sort of why you're up here and what your relationship with him was. Do you want to start, Dizzy? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Virgil was like, Virgil was um, very supportive of my work early on. Um, he was open and he, invite, he invited me into a lot of his, the spaces that he was curating, like the parties that he was doing uh, around downtown New York when they were doing Ben Trill, which um, for a kid from Houston, Texas, for me that was kind of like a space that we kind of had to engage with because the name of the, the, name of the, the brand was Ben Trill. And so it was kind of like stating a kind of already familiarity with Houston culture that was kind of like a joke, but kind of like very serious at the same time. And it sort of started the, I guess, the takeover or the, the, the sort of street uh, like uh, energy that he started to put out that led to Pyrex, which then started Off-White. Um, but my first solo exhibition um, 
I remember thinking that nobody would be interested and Virgil was the first to reach out and purchase a work from that exhibition, which was a, a kind of a work that I felt like it made sense that he would gravitate towards because it was, um, it was this piece, it was a rug. It was uh, basically, um, the idea of the exhibition was centered around my uh, like early feelings of displacement being an African in America as opposed to being African American. Um, and so a lot of my research early on was in the early formations of Nigeria. And I went back and I looked at some of the first flags that Nigeria had. Um, and one of the first flags was when they were actually just owned by a British company um, called the Royal Niger Company. And on this flag was the British flag and then next to it was uh, this emblem, which was red, yellow, and um, black, or white, sorry. And I just inverted the colors, basically, and turned it into a rug. And um, these words read as art, justice, peace in Latin, um, which I thought was a little bit ironic for uh, a country that was colonizing another country to be promoting art, justice, and peace. So it was kind of a, 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 a joke um, that I turned into a work. But he purchased this work, and I was super happy for him to have it. And uh, that's just basically my, my early interactions with Virgil. Does it? No. Does it work now? Yeah, so I kind of met uh, Virgil when I got a message from him, actually, that he, that he wanted me to somehow introduce him to Rem Kolhas. And um, obviously, Rem, um, I actually found uh, a kind of a transcription here from one of our many interviews where he says that it was really crucial for his career that Rem had just finished a student center the same year he had started to study in, uh, in Chicago. So he would learn about modernism in Chicago. He'd learn about the pillars of international design, whilst actually Ram would give lectures in the building he designed. And Michael Rock would also come. It was graphic design. And uh, in a way, uh, but he never really got to, to meet Ram at the time, because he was a student. And he somehow had found out that I had written these books uh, on, on Ram, and that Ram is a very close friend of mine, and because of us, if I would arrange a meeting. So as I always thought, you know, junction making is, is, is my work. I mean, curatorial work is junction making. Um, I, I went to Rotterdam with him and we spent a day with Rem and then we went to Amsterdam, had dinner with Rem and I rang up Marlene Dumas also. And actually what you see here, because we're having the post-its, whenever I would meet with Virgil, he do post-its for my Instagram. Uh, and one of the drawings is actually an exquisite carbs we did that night in Amsterdam with Rem Kohlhaas, the first meeting here, that's it. It's basically um, Marlene Dumas doing the, the first part, and then Virgil doing the t-shirt, free speech, and then uh, Rem uh, finished the, the drawing. And, uh, and that's, kind of, that's kind of how we, we met. And it's great Bettina Korek is there, because it was actually with Bettina that we met Virgil for the first time, briefly, here in Miami, and then many times again in in Miami, and it was particularly strange, actually, uh, for me to come to this auditorium here, this actually amazing auditorium, uh, wonderful auditorium, Theaster Gates design, because it was exactly here that maybe four years ago, we were in another auditorium with Virgil at the design for Miami, doing one of our many talks, we did lots of conversations and, and panels, and at that time, the auditorium was designed by Francis Carré, who had just designed the Serpentine Pavilion. And um, Francis had kind of designed a participatory space where basically everybody who participates, there wouldn't be a separation between you know, the audience and the speakers. Um, and we had a panel with Virgil um, where basically also Arthur Jaffer joined and Grace Wales Bono and, uh, and Torquase Dyson. Uh, and I thought it would be great to sort of talk about architecture and the sort of whole idea of Virgil to, to build a city? How could we sort of invent a city for, for the 21st century? 
And I do what I always do. I'm doing it now also. I always record panels on, you know, on my, on my phone because I never trust the recording because often, you know, I'm sure the recording works here, by the way, but often I did panels and I was told the recording doesn't work. And it was amazing because I saw Virgil do exactly the same thing. Like we sat next to each other and like at the same moment as I would switch on the phone, he telepathically also started to record it. But the thing is that he did something much more exciting than I did because I just archived it. And I think that story tells us so much about virtue because it has to do with urgency. Uh, I love the urgency always and the urgency and the permanent idea of producing reality. So at the end of the panel, we both sent the file, you know, to our assistants and collaborators to archive it. Um, but I just archived it, waiting for it to be transcribed, whereas actually Virgil immediately contacted his class in London because he used to teach architecture at the AA. Uh, and he basically asked the class to transform all of these ideas we discussed. Because obviously, it was all of us, including the, the participants, you know, it was not only the speakers, all expressed their kind of vision of you hopes, desires, how a city of the future could be different from the city we have now. More about togetherness, um, more about communion. And, uh, and Virgil basically gave the student the challenge to transform the panel into a 3D model, which I unfortunately never see, so we should try to find it. So this kind of immediate reality production, I think, tells us a lot about, about Virgil. Cool. You know what's actually really, really funny is that is that first um, OMA trip that, that, that you, Virgil, and Rem went on. He was taking photos of you guys the whole time, and we made a zine of your trip. Um, so there's a zine that exists of your, of your trip. Yeah, I just remembered. Um, no, so I met, I, met, I met Virgil on my way into architecture school in an, um, in an uh, elevator at MoMA where Chloe was... Chloe was uh, working at the time. Um, and then uh, I suppose um, what started as a friendship and uh, a series of, I guess what I would think of, uh, I, guess I, I guess I think of it as like a series of pointless, pointless projects that we, just, that, that we just never finished, but they were excuses or devices to kind of figure out how to work together. Um, and then out of them, a number of projects kind of Kind of, um, kind of um, blossomed. Um, I would say that, like, I don't know. I, at some point, I probably worked on everything at, at one point or another, as I'm sure you did at one point. Um, um, I'm trying to think what the sort of through line is of it. We worked on architecture. We shot videos, short films together. Um, worked on objects. Worked on publications. Um, some of it came out. Some of it didn't. Some of it evolved and turned into something else, um, like the example uh, of your zine that, that I think you haven't seen. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it on. I'll get into the, there's way, way too much, and I'll end up like digressing in a million directions. There are so many layers, <laughs> so many layers. Um, but you know, to kind of rebuttal before we go on like a massive, massive tangent, yeah. I met um, V in a manner which was relatively informal, but kind of formal. Um, I was working in a design uh, studio in Leicestershire in the UK. So this is like way out of the zeitgeist, way out of the microcosm of London or NY or LA. Um, but there was this, um, there was this talking point or, or, or cadence that we both understood. Um, I remember he, he had at this point maybe around 60K followers or whatnot, maybe about 11 and a half years ago. And I, I liked a few pictures from my desk and he liked a few back. Um, he found or was able to locate my email just through like a formal design bio and we opened up like a, a report immediately and th it was this conversation of you know again relatively formal hi Samuel your work looks good do you have a formal portfolio to share um, which is quite quite a typical route to go about working at this point I was operating uh, still as a multidisciplinary under maybe three or four different disciplines so one was illustration one was fine art one was soundscape uh, one was film, and my day-to-day -day was primarily product and graphic design. So at this point, prior to, uh, to V reaching out, I tried to get in contact with V for about a year and a half. I was like spamming um, Don C's inbox at RSVP, 
and you as well, bro, for time, just trying to get in touch somehow. And there wasn't this like connective tissue between us. So by the time this email had come about, there were four different URLs with different proxies and pseudonyms to share, which kind of, uh, you know, covered a lot of different disciplines of work. And immediately, um, you know, we hopped on a phone call like a day after I quit my design job instantaneously because I quickly saw there was a brick wall across the more traditional pathway of industrial design and I wanted out immediately and you know with V's uh, way of working and the client base he had accrued at this time it actually represented a sense of hope you know for once it didn't look like there was just like a cis white male view of design and of course having, having studied design history and contemporary illustration it was almost impossible to kind of see a, a POC or a slightly, uh, you know, different view of how communicative, communicative design could accommodate, accommodate the black body, whether it be diasporic or African American or Southeast Asian or East Asian. There wasn't really a viewpoint of what the roadmap was from school into a directorial role of sorts. And V was maybe the first emblem or moniker of that that one could kind of see. I mean, if you look back through the books from the 1960s and 70s, the only propagation of design as like a community tool really comes from like the civil rights black movements of how uh, fashion and attire is used. Like, you know, how semantics are used on the body. V was proposing how graphic, color, typography, uh, architecture, of course, sound, uh, acoustics and space and environment could be used as a means of an apolitical voice uh, against the status quo. All of that compressed was just highly thrilling. Um, so again, I quit my job, I started working full time as an intern, I, I took a job in the city and we would just riff back and forth for hours and as you were saying Mafuz, it was every single category which was so freeing. You know, there wasn't this idea of like a, a singular module in which one had to exist in. You would, wa you would work in like a lateral way and it was a much more anamorphic view of working. Um, and again, part of that, it wasn't just exciting, it was, it was very radical and it was quite liberal because it went against the traditional vertical structure in which one would be in employment within the design community. Um, and from there, again, it, as, as you were saying, it's this real rabbit hole of ideation which kind of went forward and the idea of, of the pilot uh, or, or the proto was really important to be. This idea of having these um, speculative products which maybe didn't have a proof of, proof of concept in market but had something to say culturally. Or, or spiritually. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring that up, and, and Hans Ulrich, you also uh, you use the words immediate reality production, because that, I think it, the idea of pacing and this really intense, fast pace, and this idea of also multitasking is sort of antithetical to Western architectural production, right? Um, and I think it might be part of Virgil's work that may, maybe continues to be misunderstood. Um, you know, in the sense that, like, that way of working was by design. And I wonder, and this is a question that anyone can answer, if any of you think that that way of working and that influence has reshaped the way designers and architects are, are working today, especially younger generations. Well, it's, it's already kind of reshaped the way that I've worked. Yeah. Because I think one of the biggest differences uh, between me and Virgil actually in terms of our work was the, just the, the rate of output. Yeah. And so I think that's what I'm actually kind of chasing is kind of just like this more like free just spilling of work coming out and not being so caught up in like exactly how the work is going to be interpreted and exactly putting the work in the perfect context for it to exist, just putting it out in general. It's what I'm trying to get more comfortable doing, and I think that's what he was kind of a symbol of. Infinite immediacy. Infinite immediacy, almost. And just to kind of jump in on like, the idea of like, the multidisciplinary archetype within design, like, obviously you had like, your Vanellis, and you had Yeems, and you had the Conrans between like, the 50s and the 70s, who were savants in their own right. Um, but then there's kind of like this lost ideology of being able to be a hyphenate across the, the, the disciplines between, you know, like the 80s up to the early 2000s. You know, this idea of like specialism comes, comes, comes about, whether it be through, you know, the work produced under, under Benetton campaigns, it was more so traditional 
modules in which one communicated within it felt like. And V, again, it felt like this, um, this convex or like, you know, uh, new, new archetype which was being reintroduced, which we'd only read about in school books. It wasn't necessarily like a, like a, a living uh, example of that until V started to really stimulate this new behavior or ideology. Yeah, I was gonna say that like I think it's important to draw draw sort of draw sort of a line between the ways in which Virgil worked like very clearly in a tradition and he had clear sort of antecedents. Because I feel like there's been like an immense sort of effort to like render him ahistorical, you know, sort of like it's kind of like black guy that does a million different things and we've never seen anything like this before but we have and he he was in touch with those people and he worked with those people like rem for instance i mean i mean in a lot of ways i think he was very he was very much aware of some of the theoretical frameworks that oma really set up in the 90s around advertising as a kind of ultimate realization of architecture um cynically like i mean they, they kind of cynically uh positioned it that way but 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 I think but I think I think he was aware of that and I think he was in active dialogue with it and you see that because those people that he was in dialogue with he ended up working with Jenny Holter Lawrence Wiener he finds them you know he finds them and he communicates with them then on the then on the other side you'd say the way in which he's different um, I, I'd say one in terms of like methodology and I was struggling with this during, a, during an earlier talk to sort of uh, uh, attempt to describe an, sort of a vibe or an, something that's a vibe or an energy that you slip into, like a vibe around production that is rigorous insofar as there is a method because everyone that's in it and is good at it um, uh, swims, floats, right? Is like able to, able to work and everyone speaks the same language. But it's not something... Um, that you're able to reproduce afterwards in, in kind of like a really clear way. And so in that sense, Virgil was unique because the method was unique. And the method was kind of capable of outputting so many different things, yeah. right? Um, um, I would also say an, another way in which he's unique, and sorry, I'll stop rambling in a second, is, uh, is rap, hip hop, right? It's, it's not just that he was black, it's that he made uh, he made a he made a really really serious effort to place rap culture, hip hop culture, black electronic music culture, the DJ, in dialogue with a lot of disciplines that it was uh, that that it was kind of used as a reference for. Right, I was talking about this earlier today. The DJ is used as a reference. You know, architects are like DJs. Multi hyphenates are like DJs, except you know, dot, 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 they're not actually DJs, right? Um, and so he kind of placed, placed like the DJ at the epicenter of things. And so anyways, I just, I just wanted to sort of draw sort of a line between saying, okay, he is an architect within a certain tradition. And as you said, we, we have gone through a period of hyper-specialization, hyper you know, over the last like 30 years in which people are like, oh, do you work on buildings, right? Like that kind of question made a comeback, you know? Um, but but he's like very much a traditional architect in certain ways, yeah. you know, and I think that's... I, I'm curious, I mean, just to, to talk about the traditions, I know the comparison to the Bauhaus and the sort of Eastern emigre professors at I, IAT who are setting up this, you know, sort of American Bauhaus thinking. I, I also see such a, a, a deep connection to the Chicago black arts movement and Afrocobra and Jay Jarrell and even Robert Page and thinking about advertising um, uh, Vince Cullors and Emmett McBain and that sort of complete confluence of art and life and street and building and body and community and, and commerce and culture, you know, which is something that I think still is an uncomfortable conversation, you know, in many institutional settings, uh, but also in cultural settings. And I, I wondered if he thought about that movement at all as being influential in terms of self as an architect from Chicago who crossed boundaries. It's a really interesting, really interesting point uh, because I was actually thinking about Jay Jarrell this afternoon mm -hmm. in, in relation to, uh, to Virgil. And um, a few, actually, I think it was last year uh, or earlier this year, I forgot, I, I you know, tried to kind of re make an oral history mm -hmm. of the Africobra movement. So we brought together in Chicago 
Um, at the fair, basically, all the surviving members and protagonists of, uh, and actually Wadsworth and Shea Jarrell came, you know, after Africa Horror Movements, have tried to find out how, how it connects. And of course, the idea of Shea Jarrell of starting her own brand, you know, having the shop, at the same time having an art practice, having this total fluidity of practice is, um, is definitely something uh, which, which relates to virtue. But I think I wanted to connect to what you all said before in terms of architecture. Um, I think it's super interesting that sort of at the beginning when we met with Virgil, you know, we, we discussed a lot about exhibitions, we discussed a lot about, you know, collaborations on exhibition. Uh, he also participated in my Enzo Mare show, but in a way, the last couple of months, uh, our text exchanges had more and more to do with actually him building architecture. And yes. I really do believe that that's the sort of direction, I don't know about the other thing, but that's the kind of direction the work the work took, and, and, and in a way, I mean, we see it here in the drawing, there is a drawing actually of a, <clears throat> of a horizontal skyscraper, but then sort of, um, I started to receive more and more text messages about him wanting to actually build um, a kind of a tower in Kensington Garden, the idea we always were discussing, you know, what could we do at the Serpentine, and uh, he had this idea, and, and I think, yeah, it probably connects to the Bauhaus, but actually connects much more maybe to the Bauhaus than to the Bauhaus, to Lisitsky. He sort of started to send me drawings and sketches by text of a kind of a tower he imagined. And it, of course, has to do also with these last sculptures, which Clemence and Didier showed me earlier today, of these scales, no? which were uh, basically, um, I think, the last pieces he realized. Um, and the, the whole idea would be actually that these scales would have become almost like, you know, um, accessible sculptures, where one could go really high and see the city from above, and there could be messages. And I really do believe that, I mean, that's obviously an unrealized project, but that, that there was this sort of trajectory, because at the beginning, Virgil started with architecture. And he always told me that he felt that it went too slow for him. And when he had an idea in fashion, he could basically have a prototype, and it all could happen like within 24 hours. And, and in a way, I do think that he was sort of on his way to come back to architecture. I don't know what the others feel about that. I agree. I think outside of the fall, winter Louis Vuitton show, there was like a rusted structure that I remember him seeing. And I remember being really excited when seeing that because I thought, OK, we're about to start seeing architecture from him. But I guess that was probably. Do you have any insight on, on that project, like the rusted, like it was like kind of like a rectangular structure outside of the show? Which, which in, um, in Paris, the Louis Vuitton show? Which, which um, show, though? Uh, fall, winter, 19. Oh, oh yeah. sky, right. No, no, I don't. Yeah, no. Oh, there we go. It was like this rusted structure that, 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 was, that, was, that was there. No, this was the, this was the box. Yeah. Oh, that was just the box? Yeah, yeah that's when it was covered. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. so he covered it. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's when it was covered. Okay. Yeah, that's when it was covered. To rift on that, though, you know, one of the last conversations that we had in September in, the, in 180 Strand in London, um, you know, there was this huge conversation that we were rifting on, um, on the idea of like service and service design, the idea of like church, libraries, public sector. Um, Mufuz on your side, like what, like, what, what did you guys kind of have, have planned as on like the wider periphery in, in terms of like years to come or aspirations or like in tangibles terms of, or? In terms of, um, in terms of architecture? Specifically like, in architecture, like yeah. Like court, like traditional. Um, <laughs> That's a funny question. I, I, think, I think a couple times we had some like false, false like starts where I think once we got super excited and put an RFP on the internet that we were down to work on anyone's building for free, um, that, was, that was a mistake because Virgil is very famous and yeah, that was, that was a late night mistake that resulted in a lot, of, a lot of emails and a lot of strange Zoom calls with like a hotelier in Denmark that was, that was kind of a megalomaniac it was kind of a megalomaniac that Virgil was almost down to do something with. And then I got terrified. And then, <laughs> um, but, but I don't know, we kind of, we kind of talked about all, everything is architecture. Yes. I mean, I think, I think, I think not, and not, not as, not as examples of architectural thinking, but literal architecture. Yeah, in a technical right? sense, right? like retail, so, retail is a proxy. Exactly. So like films, um, a lot of the films that we a lot of the films that we like worked on, everything from the methods, like like the storyboarding and the sort of like laying out of the structure, 
um, to to the realization of sets. You know, that was like a big part of how he worked through ideas, architectural ideas, was kind of the fashion show as a pavilion, right? Like that that was that that was always really really important to him that like that like the structure has an architectural gesture whose importance sometimes, in, depending on the project, um, would um, supersede that of the show itself, you know? Um, I, I mean, yeah, this is, this, this is an example. Um, I think another thing that was really important, I'm digressing, but, but I'm just gonna keep riffing. No, 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 keep, yeah, keep yeah. rifting. Like, my another mind thing, is so... Go ahead. Another thing is like, and uh, Benji, Benji B alluded to this in his, um, in his uh, talk about music, was like symbolic and referential overcode like like the overcoding and the overlapping of things as a methodology, you know, like like just in this image on the left, you have Alan Caprow's fluids, right, melting. You have sight and James Wines very self-consciously, right. That's also a finish that ended up on a suit. So you have camouflage, marble camouflage. You also have the reference to yeah. you know West African Congolese malachite coming exactly. into play, which is exactly. also powered on on Wall Street. Exactly. Know? That's a that's a that's a LV Eames chair, but it's a bootleg, right? It's a bootleg. So you have like bootleg culture. I mean, the list goes, the list goes on and on. I mean, those are fake and paper, paper boxes, but the, the marble on the floor is real. So there are like a lot of things where he was starting to, I think, work out a grammar, like a sort of grammar, like a recurring grammar. Um, and, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of sad to say, but I, I think, yeah, he was, he was absolutely gonna build real buildings. And uh, by any standard, it would have been very, very early for someone to do that. He was completely, he, he, was just, he, he was just filling the time that most architects spend thinking about what they're going to build, making all sorts of other things. And so, um, as a last point, and then I'll shut up, even, even sort of architecture, the studio, at, the studio at Nike, right, started as a bit of a troll. We were like, if you have a website, you're an architecture office because I've been on tons of websites and there's nothing on them, but they appear to be architecture offices. So let's make a website, and then, right, right? And then like, that's how it started. And then, you know, we started saying, it'd be really, really funny. We could start a magazine and call it Architecture Magazine. We start a film studio and call it Architecture Films. And all the things that supposedly fall outside the purview of architecture we could refer to as architecture. But as time went on, it got more and more serious. And um, it's, its ambitions were more and more serious. Uh, so yeah, anyways, this was a long-winded way of saying that, yeah, he was definitely gonna build, build buildings, for sure. But I, I think, I think this idea that an architectural practice has to move towards building buildings is actually, like, right? Like, what we're talking about is actually that everything is architecture, right? Or this idea, the proposal, that every, the provocation that everything is architecture. And what does that mean if everything is designed and you can have agency over everything or you can redesign something, you can edit, you know, in the 3% rule, right? Like, that, to me, you know, to use a maybe empty word now is, is radical and actually to like not have a building to reference as, you know, the, the pinnacle of a process is, is important to this conversation, right? Of, of um, how I think Virgil has influenced a new way of, of being a designer or an architect and opened up the discipline in a really particular way. Um, I just, as you were talking, I started thinking about Yona Friedman in particular, someone who Hans has a particular, had a particular relationship. Um, we both worked on projects together with him, but you spent many hours interviewing him. And this, this idea also on this sticky note, um, and I'm sorry, my eyesight is so bad. You know, in honor of skyscrapers in the middle of nowhere, please find the below DWG file. I mean, thinking about, you know, Yona's idea of informal architecture and the cloud and how people can build together, you know, without any sort of rules. I mean, that lawlessness is something that I think really resonates here. Yeah, I think it's fascinating also if you think about uh, these, uh, you know, unrealized projects uh, you mentioned of, of Yona and, you know, the floating city, for example, you know, 
what would happen with such projects in the metaverse. And I've actually also been thinking when I was listening to you before, you know, in terms of uh, architecture, what, you know, Virgil would have built maybe in the metaverse, of course, because of course, you wouldn't have to, you know, the laws of gravity, right, in the, in the metaverse. But I found that we had a transcript actually of this panel which happened here with, with Virgil and uh, in, in Keres architecture. And what Virgil said is he says, you know, he assumed, he said, I'm a fashion designer, that word wasn't used for me, but instead of rejecting it, opposing it, I decided I'm going to take it and give principles to it. Once I decided that fashion wasn't just this category for a young person like me to play in, but I decided that I wanted to play in all creative disciplines. And so, and I think that that's kind of in a way what maybe also this idea of architecture, so it's not kind of coming back to architecture, but architecture or building of architecture would just be one of many parallel realities because there's also yeah. the work as a visual artist, there is the work as a, and it wouldn't, so, so I think it's almost like in quantum physics. It's parallel realities. And that brings us back to Jona. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think we should talk about placemaking a little bit because, like, digging into placemaking, it's sort of, you know, something that I have always associated, especially as it, it's become more and more part of a, a, a contemporary design parlance, as being something that is hyper, hyper local. And when I think about, uh, Virgil as a placemaker, it's exactly the opposite, right? It's about maybe creating like an exploded universal place that anyone can participate in or riff off of to make their own place. Um, and there are so many different, all of these ways of working that everyone has described has contributed to this. But there was, speaking of James Wines, for the Willie show, Virgil spoke with James and Awana about, about Willie's career. And, um, and there was, a, there was a, a quote from something that he said that I've gone back to a few times and wanted to read to everyone. Sorry, it's a little bit long, but I think it's important to sort of like setting up this conversation about placemaking. Um, so I'm quoting, I, for one, found the gray area in between architecture, art, music, and fashion as a space that is contextless. I've had predecessors before me try to exist in these silos, and much like Willie, through learning a story, I found freedom in the street. I found freedom in that edge, the threshold before the establishment, because there's freedom there, there's expression, there's an endless abyss of inspiration and real stories to be told. Um, so Virgil, he's talking about the street in particular as more than a place. Um, and as a basis of a new contemporary artistic movement, something that also struck me about the Harvard lecture is that this like, you know, end of Western art history, there's streetwear. <laughs> and so what does that mean? The street is a metaphor. I mean, something that many artists before have also conjured, but you know, how is streetwear like our contemporary art movement and what does that mean in terms of creating a place? To speak simply, it feels like it's the contemporary version of like the Venetian Palazzo or, or almost the, the, the courtyard of sorts. You know, streetwear almost became this propagation for, you know, the other or wider society to be able to congregate and still have like a, a particular view expressed which didn't necessarily fit within like a more traditional context of fashion. Um, the idea of, again, like atypical design actually having like a periphery to operate within. And I think the, the analogy of the street is really interesting there because there's no restraint on the purity of the air quality. There's no restraint on the elevation in which you can build. The idea of uh, being able to weave in and out of like different infrastructures and cut through. It doesn't allude to not being able to enter the building, but to be able to pass through, um, you know, with a level of uh, modality that one couldn't, uh, operate with if you operate within the infrastructure itself and I think he really understood that of course with the traditional background and education and whatnot understanding how to proxy and propagate and I think we see that come about also you know back to your earlier note on the the uh, one of the set designs for the interior film shot with Saul uh, Williams involved this idea of being able to uh, proxy faux pas materials with real materials is almost quite similar to the analogy of being able to have one foot in the establishment of one foot out, one foot on the road and one foot within, you know, the, uh, the, the, the reception foyer one must still engage with. Um, there was a real understanding of like the buoyancy and, and, and the pendulum swing of not othering to a point of 
being extradited from a conversation, but understanding how to step in and step out continuously and have that reverb exist, you know? As rifting, yeah, rifting, yeah. rifting, rifting. Yeah, for sure. I'm thinking about placemaking because it's... Uh, and tension points that come with that. Yeah. Um, black man making space inside brands for other black people to make shit. It's, it's, yeah. Is it just architecture? I don't, like, it's, it's big. It's, 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 it's really it's, big. It's, like it's really big. Like, it's, as well. it's bigger than streetwear. Like, like, streetwear is a specific, it's, it's really, uh, I think that's one of the, one of the things that is the most challenging to reproduce because it's sort of, the only, the only sort of artifacts that it leaves behind are people, right? Like, there's, there's nothing that, you know, we're, we're, like, we're like working on a museum show right now, you know, and, and it's about his design, design work with Nike, but obviously it's, oh, amazing. <laughs> what's, up? what's up, dude? Um, but, it's, uh, but it's very, very, yeah, it's very, very hard to represent that the greatest achievement was the space he opened up in Nike not the artifacts, right? Like, like the space that he made in, in Louis Vuitton. Yes. You know what I, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like why, why are we in there like stoned making decisions we're not qualified to make? And he's like leaving us to do that. You know, you know what I mean? Like leaving us to do that and trusting us to do that and, and fighting a million wars and putting out a million fires that we don't see the entire time all around us, you know? Um, and so, and so, yeah, when you say space, space making, I mean, I think about the Astor. I mean, the Astor can speak about this better than, better than I can, but like, you know, black man, black man making space for other black people in white space is, it's, it's, it's a lot. And, and we it's need to lot. talk about like category creation and market share creation. Because prior to, you know, Virgil creating this ideology and understanding of like luxury streetwear or luxury atypical goods that did not actually exist. So the idea of like, space and the street creating mass which could actually have a commercial uplift which then became tangible mass and tangible space was huge which then equated to the square meterage of you know you guys building in the rvmh offices it, the, having this like remuneration associated with the space and with the study hadn't really occurred before yeah if, if maybe if, if we could also imagine uh the place making as a kind of index, an index within a compendium of visual language, spatial language, racial language, that it, it seemed like a creative that could put a mark inside of a lexicon and, and create like a new subcategory or a new category so that if all you understood in art history was, you know, medieval this or um, modern this, that it was like, oh, we never had a reference name, we never had a folder or a, a category for what happens on the street. Because what happens on the street was never valid to some company. But by, by determining that there needed to be another category, a, a pin dropped, placemaking could also be that like, what could we offer within art history to make it recognize that it's forgotten all these things. And I was like, oh, these things have been happening for the last millennia. We're gonna bring all of these things that you left out. We're gonna bring them forward under this new category. And, and what happens is that you realize that it's not 2018 or 2019. It's all the things that we've forgotten about or that we refuse to acknowledge for the last 450 years. And, and that, that could then conflate itself on Louis Vuitton or Nike. And it's like, oh, you never acknowledged uh, street ballers. You only acknowledged NBA athletes. Let me show you how important street ballers are to this situation. So I think that in that sense, I thought I would talk about Chicago and about the fact that my conversations with Virgil were like, man, I should maybe, I should, I should dig into Chicago and Africa Hi-Fi and like all the little conversations we were having about house music and, and, and what it would mean to have a, a manufacturing facility on the south side of Chicago 
or like something that was as big as what was happening in Milan or Tuscany. But so there's that. But I think the more interesting part was that like Virgil seemed willing to create a new category among important categories and say, you guys, you forgot all of, not just you forgot black people, because I think that the, the people who love Virgil were, were all people. And they were all people who felt like they didn't fit into the preceding categories of art history. So placemaking as a kind of finger and a folder that's like, oh, there's room for us too. So well said, it's just this idea of almost fracking untapped soil to a degree, you know, that really comes into mind, being able to, you know, cultivate all of the sediment, as you were saying, from like a millennial or so, which hadn't been articulated, he was able to have that one view. And of course, the, the crux and axis of it was, of course, you know, hip hop, rap culture, contemporary culture of the now, but there are all these different oscillations of that, which were starting to kind of widen and, 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 and converge. Mm. Yeah, the, the one, uh, the the first conversation I had with Virgil was at Soho House, Miami. <laughs> and uh, we were sitting around, and I remember that conversation so vividly because he was like, you know, it doesn't really matter what you make, what matters is my brand. And, and so placemaking then as the ability to kind of hijack uh, whatever, to, to, to ride on top of a thing, to determine one's rightful place on top of that thing. So it was like, well, if my first conversation with Virgil was about his brand being able to supersede other things, then why not put his brand on my shit and, and, and then allow that conversation? So I think in some ways today is a, a demonstration of Virgil's ability to make place and make space for himself and others on top of pre-existing uh, modes of modernism, minimalism, uh, fair work, token commercial shit, um, civil rights, like take it and then add Virgil, and then that thing becomes something totally, it's something totally different. And I, and I think that the, the bad part of brands is that brands know that they can take genius, put it on top of their shit and make their brand better. What I think, but Virgil was the opposite. He knew that he could take mediocre things, put grace and love and intelligence on top of mediocre things and make those mediocre things better. In terms of, of bringing people along, I mean, something that has come up in, in every single conversation that's happened today is how Virgil found people, found creativity, um, you know, found someone on Instagram or, you know, through a text message or on a dance floor or someplace and, and brought them into a creative journey and to participate and collaborate. And I'm, I'm curious about, and maybe Mufo is your best position to, to answer this question, like what that looks like, you know, after 10 years, after so much time, you know, what is that like map look like of all of these people um, who've participated in this bigger project? It's massive. I, I don't even, I meet, I, I meet people all the time that are like, I was like working on this with Virgil and then I'm like, ah, probably not. And then they show it to me and I'm like, oh, you were. <laughs> like, oh, and you've been doing this for like five years. <laughs> You know, and I had no idea. This is super developed. And they're just like scrolling, like, see, see, see. And I'm like, wow, you know? So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty endless. I mean, I suppose from like a methodological standpoint, um, you know, since, since Virgil passed, I think, I at least, I don't know about the other, the other friends, but I get a lot of calls about, hey, I'm looking for a graphic designer to do this. Who did Virgil work with? Or I'm looking for a, you know, or I'm looking for like a DP for this, or I'm looking for, you know, it's like a constant thing, or, or do you know like a fabrication studio? And I'm like, and then I end up answering the question like, I'm like, yes, I know this guy, he's not a graphic designer, you know what I mean? He's a club promoter, but he also does graphic design, and he's the guy that should do your graphic design. And they're like, does he have a website? Nope. What does he have? He has an Instagram, right? You know, I, and, and it's a recurring thing, you know? I know this graphic designer who doesn't make graphic design, he's a videographer. And he's probably better than that graphic designer that 
that, that, that you'd otherwise hit. Virgil kind of created a community like that, of like sort of strange widgets, like strange sort of unique, he had a way of like finding the right, the right person for the right job, but it's not readily apparent at all. You know, I think uh, I ended up directing videos because of him, you know, because I, I, I wrote one and I was like, who are we gonna get to direct this? And he was like, you, you know? Um, you know, and then we and then we got on set, and you know, he was he was just like you know like Academy Award winning DP. Meet Mafuz, and he's like, oh, the director. He's like, I don't know, but he's in charge. You know, like that kind of thing. Um, and so, I don't know if that's answering your question correctly, but it's kind of a really strange, large, large, very generous, very generous community, where people are good at a lot of different things. Um, yeah. Well, then it breaks down this idea of, of expertise, right? Or like of an expertise that's built by a particular type of experience, you know, which I think is, is integral to this understanding of like what you can make when you're maybe not focused on perfectionism, like when you're interested in the process of making and making as a form of connecting, um, you know, which is something that I think um, has really had an influence over anyone who has like touched in any way Virgil. Mm -hmm. I think also the idea of um, to just kind of do it, the, the sort of do it yourself aspect is, is something which is super important in, in, relation, uh, in relation to that. And uh, I mean, I remember we spoke a lot at the moment of the Enzo Mare show with Virgil about, you know, autoprojectazione, which is of course Enzo Mare's, you know, landmark project of DIY design, where basically everybody all over the world can just do it, can yeah. basically use these instructions. Um, and that's something which I always felt was very much at the, at the core of the practice, um, in a way, uh, the idea of, of, of basically um, having almost like scars, no? and uh, where many, many people all over the world can participate, can, can do it. It was a bit like the thing we discussed here when we talked about this city. You know, he, um, wanted to build with all of us was a, was a kind of a, a DIY thing and everybody, everybody could participate. And it's interesting um, when one of the last things we worked on was actually during the lockdown, um, when also the Mari show happened, uh, we relaunched this Do It project, which is a, a sort of a project based on, on instructions. Fiesta also participated in that um, uh, many years ago. And I asked Virgil to kind of contribute uh, an instruction and I wanted to read it here because I think it has a lot to do with this idea also the sort of situationist kind of approach to to instructions because there is this idea I never know how to translate it into English the detournement I don't know what that would be in English it's, it's kind of using an instruction and almost sort of turn it into its turn it into its opposite kind of um, finding a way of um, yeah of turning it what would it be it's Detour like a swerve I mean yeah it's like a swerve. Determinant is used in English too to describe it, but it's like a swerve. Swerve, yeah, thank like you. And so, yeah. and so that has, I think, a lot to do with, with, with the way Virgil used instruction. Here is the do it instruction he wrote. How to pickpocket the establishment, read the black canon, understand the nature of man, prototype, release, and repeat. I mean, this is like deep proxy, like decentralized yeah. org charts with specialists who like traverse across different, you know, sectors of, of a decentralized company is the best way to put it. And it goes back to some of the early points you made, Mafuz, about the way of working. It was this like huge coalescing of different multi hyphenates, but everyone actually was quite specialized. They were just placed into different rooms to kind of coordinate and remap. You know, that, that, that thing that Hans just did, like Hans is constantly proposing a problem that's like a problem you can solve in like 30 seconds or with a line drawing or a, a one sentence, you know? And I think that when, when people talk about design or whatever, they're often talking about like, oh, one's ability to solve a problem. And I think that, that one doesn't have to be an expert at solving problems to solve a problem. That they can be a, a person that does things a lot and then a problem arises, and they say, oh, that's the problem, I can solve it. And I think b because we've become such a culture that honors, that values, put, puts monetary value 
on expertise and discipline and schooling or training and provenance and that, that those things were all predeterminants to set values higher and higher. But what happens if you're just back to the basic problem of my car needs its insides tricked out? Can you trick it out? Right? And, it, and you're left with a basic problem like, yeah, I can trick out a car. I've never tricked out a car. But I can trick out a car. I was like, oh, your champagne bottle? I fuck with champagne. I can trick out a champagne bottle. You know, and it's, and it's like, rather than saying, I'm not a champagne bottle graphic design expert. Definite optimism. Right? Applied. Yeah, and, it, and then it's like, well, that's where the innovation comes in because it's, it's not that you're unintelligent, ill-informed, it's that expertise isn't the criteria for solving the problem. And I think that, that, that for me at least, good design is sometimes that ability for a person who has hand ability, intelligence, knowledge of the histories of solving problems, when that person approaches a problem with fresh eyes, you might find an innovation in the field where everybody's been solving the problem in the same way. Virgil, you know. Do you think that approach is American? It's definitely not Italian, <laughs> right? Like, it's, it's definitely not, you know, like, I remember the first time, 10 years ago, I used the term ar uh, archive. And I didn't say I was an archivist, I said I had archives. An archivist said to me, I'm sorry, sir, you do not have archives. And I was like, no, I, I got archives. <laughs> and she was like, no, it's not an archive. And it was, and it was a, what she was saying was that whatever the criteria was of my things and their retrievability and their um, uh, lexicon, indexical, self-referential, connected to other institutional archives, whatever all that shit was, I, I wasn't in that club. Now, what I've come to understand is that like, maybe there's a difference between my Frankie Knuckles collection and then once I've digitized, retrieved my Frankie Knuckles, then I have a Frankie Knuckles archive. But what was interesting for me was to say, um, I have some things. I know where they is. If you want Godard, Godard's over there. If you want Foucault, Foucault's over there. That's retrievability. I got an archive. Hamza knows where his books are. So it's like, well, is there an informal archive and a formal archive? And so I think that in that sense, you know, um, do Americans have a kind of self-possession? Now, sometimes people front. I'm not talking about fronting. I'm not talking about like saying you do something you don't do. I'm talking about like, oh, I, I will myself to be a great archivist one day, therefore, I am starting as an archivist today. And, and, and I, I'm starting as an archivist today because I have some albums, and they're organized alphabetically. And I, I, if I'm looking for Luther Vandross, I don't start at Peebo Bryson. I start at Whitney Houston, or I go down to like, you know, I don't know, Sarah Vaughn. I, but I have a sense of the thing like that. And so I, I do think, I love people like Tony Lewis, who, he, Tony might say, I don't do anything very well. Like, like, or a Japanese person would say, I'm working on this and they've been working on it for 30 years. So Americans might leap faster, but I think that in this case, if we're talking about like hip hop, or we're talking about millenniality, or New Style, New Style might say, they might claim expert sooner when what they mean is enthusiasm that leads to expertise. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I, I thought it, it might be good for us to take a minute to just say what hasn't been said yet, or what we think it's important to say. Um, thank you, Theaster. We probably should have dropped the mic after that, but you know. 
<laughs> no, no one can follow. Um, but you know, we've talked about everything from you know, participating in a discipline to reacting against a discipline to thinking about you know, functioning in between business and culture to metaphors to improvisation. I don't, we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> But is there anything that we haven't said that we want to say before we close? I suppose, uh, just briefly, um, humility. I feel like a lot has been said about Virgil, but like humility is a methodology. I mean, Theaster was, I was, I was, you know, I was, you know, listening to, to Theaster and thinking to myself about, about partially as a form of camouflage, right? I mean, V was also very good at, he didn't like to, he didn't like other people to know how much he knows about a subject, right? That's, that's a technique. If Louis Vuitton feels like they're educating you, they give you more space, and then you use that space, and you have more control. You're able to hide in that space. Um, um, and the same goes with any brand that he worked with. But he was also the type of person that, you know, uh, he lets a curator lead him through the gallery and tell him about things he already knows because he wants to get to know them, which, when you're black, is a very, very frequent occurrence, right? He lets them talk to him about Le Corbusier and point to this chair and point to that painting and he doesn't say a word. He lets it all go and then they get closer and closer and closer. And that kind of humility as a, as a method, um, especially when you're black, it takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of strength. You eat a lot of shit, you know? And he was able to metabolize all of it and make a kind of a very fun, a very joyful space in which um, everyone else could work and, and could work together. And so, so, yeah, that's my kind of parting thought. Yeah. Um, I said it's really, as you're saying, like the optimism, the optimism and like the constant mediation of being able to avoid uh, immediate conflict through all these different means of, of proxying is like an eternal lesson. Um, I would just say sustainability. Um, in a sense, not, not in an environmental sense, but just finding a way to take whatever it is that you're interested in and be able to do it um, as often as you can. And I think that led me to um, actually, you know, actually relocating and finding a space in rural Lisbon um, in a warehouse that I was able to convert because I didn't want to have to rely on, you know, the sort of, commercial side of the art world so much and I just really wanted to be able to just make what I wanted and I think that's definitely in the spirit of Virgil you know just that. and I think maybe also uh, this idea of listening uh, the, my friend Etel Anand, the late poet and, and artist um, who always said that we kind of have to learn to listen again and I think Virgil's art of listening is really important, and it's a totally transgenerational art of listening. It can be listening to very old, you know, wise people, but can also listen to somebody much younger than him. And I will never forget when we were in Amsterdam and Rotterdam that day, here with Marlene Dumas and Rem, to come back to the drawing. Uh, Virgil told me that he's always figuring things out. He, he says he, he doesn't feel accomplished. He, he kind of feels like, yeah, like an intern, he said. That's the quote, figuring things out. And, uh, and that idea, I think, I mean, it goes back to what you said about humility, but I think also the idea of listening and, and, and learning is something we can always learn from Roger. Thank you. Thank you.